This lecture is part of the um, History 363 Modern Africa class, um, and uh, it will address uh, Southern Africa in the 19th century, really up until about 1870 or so. And this is a very different geographic situation uh, than we've encountered previous to this time. You can see here from this kind of schematic um, that somebody has, has done of Southern Africa on the slide here that um, there is uh, Southern Africa is cut off by some uh, geographic obstacles from the other parts of Africa from the rest of sub-Saharan Africa on the one hand we have an incredibly dry desert here uh, called the Kalahari uh, which comprises or which covers most of the area um, of the modern nations of Botswana and Namibia and also extends down here into uh, what is now South Africa um, to some extent. Uh, the northern part of Botswana and then up here into uh, what is now Zambia and Zimbabwe north of the Limpopo River uh, becomes more um, fertile but the rainfall line um, that allows for agriculture uh, really sort of runs up here and so most of this area I mean down here into the desert you know there's obviously no farming and uh, very little animal raising um, certainly not cattle but uh, in most of this region uh, all through what is now you know south at least the western and northern parts of South Africa uh, and up here into Zimbabwe and Zambia um, uh, this is suitable mostly for pastoralism, um, maybe a little bit of agriculture, but mostly the raising of animals. Um, and it's cut off by the Drakensberg Mountains here from these regions to the east, which are more fertile. In fact, one of the best agricultural regions of all of Africa is down here in the, um, the region now known as KwaZulu-Natal. Um, and uh, that area was uh, inhabited by farmers, uh, probably dating from around 1000 CE or so, um, with the Bantu migrations into this area. Uh, and so cattle uh, would be particularly important for the peoples of these, these regions. Um, though with the spread of the Bantu, um, you know, from East Africa down here into Southern Africa, the original inhabitants of this area, the, the so-called uh, Khoisan peoples, and yes, there was a click in that. This is not a problem with your speakers. Um, there will be a few words today where uh, we will be clicking. Um, this is a part of these languages. Um, I lived in South Africa and used to practice all the time so I could learn how to click. Uh, in my normal classroom classes, I teach students at least some of the fundamentals of these click languages. Um, I don't speak them uh, fully, but I, I can pronounce things uh, in any case. So. Uh, sorry if that's disorienting for anyone. Um, so uh, factors in southern African history in this period, the geography and the climate is tremendously important. This is a dry climate. It's also much of southern Africa is a plateau and so the elevation is fairly high. Of course there are these the, the Drakensberg Mountains uh, run through South Africa there and um, you know that creates uh, that contributes to the formation of the, uh, the societies and the cultures of this region. Cattle were tremendously important and going back many centuries, uh, probably um, into the first millennium CE even, uh, we have the establishment of chieftains um, based on the ownership and raising of cattle where uh, distinctions in the societies were created on the basis of cattle ownership and I talked about this a little bit in discussing East Africa about how cattle was the main source of wealth um, all through Africa for many centuries that is particularly the case for southern Africa already in the northern parts of what is now uh, Botswana um, and in two parts of what is now Zambia and Zimbabwe there were sort of cattle-based societies with chieftains uh, who owned the largest share of the cattle. Um, this culminated in the 13th and 14th centuries with uh, the establishment of large, well, uh, 
at least uh, fairly large kingdoms, um, the most important of which was the Shona kingdom, Shona being the, the language uh, group, or rather the, the, the Bantu language spoken, uh, the Shona uh, kingdom called Great Zimbabwe. And uh, Great Zimbabwe was uh, is a, uh, a massive set of stone walls and compounds. Um, uh, most identifiable are um, a ritual center on a hilltop and uh, the compound that belonged to the ruler of Great Zimbabwe. And the basis of his rule was the ownership of cattle, though uh, Great Zimbabwe did also trade with the Sofala coast, with the Swahili coast, um, uh, did, you know, especially the city of Sofala, um, uh, down in the region of what is now Mozambique um, and southern Tanzania. Uh, and so Great Zimbabwe was tied into the Indian Ocean trade uh, a little bit, but it was in the interior um, and uh, was given over mostly to the raising of cattle um, and these these cattle-based societies. As the Bantu moved south um, during the period of Bantu migration, and again, this was a piecemeal migration. This wasn't a grand migration of, you know, thousands of people at the same time or anything like that. These are small farmers uh, gradually moving south as they exhaust the fertility of the soil and, and move to discover virgin soil, um, and as they sought for, for pasturage for their cattle. Um, they gradually moved into this area, and, and some of them took up uh, uh, cattle raising on the Highfeld Plateau here, and uh, some of them discovered down here in, in um, the region known as KwaZulu-Natal that there was good farmland, and so they brought agricultural knowledge with them from further to the north um, and began to farm this region, growing sorghum um, and a few other crops. And, and these southern African societies were invariably polygamous, um, uh, the control of women's fertility and women's labor. Women were the the, the uh, main laborers in agriculture. Men were the ones who did the fighting uh, and the hunting uh, and such things, uh, and also the the governing of society. Uh, these were very much um, patriarchal and um, uh, patrilineal societies. Uh, the inheritance passing from you know uh, through the father's side of the family from father to son. Um, but they met up with the Khoisan people uh, who lived in this region. Uh, these are some of the, uh, well, the, the oldest people on earth uh, in terms of their, their kind of DNA makeup. Um, uh, if, if mankind originated in Africa, as, as the prevailing theory holds, that the, the San people probably were, uh, are the closest direct ancestors from um, the, the original human beings of, um, uh, of East Africa, you know, going back even a couple of million years, um, but um, or at least a few hundred thousand years. Uh, and so the Bantu drove the Khoisan into the desert, um, and this happened very gradually. Now, some of the San people did take up the uh, raising of cattle. They adopted that from the Bantu. Um, and so we have this uh, distinction between the different San groups uh, those in the desert region were mostly hunter-gatherers. Those in uh, further down here uh, into South Africa, in, into the savanna region, into the high-filled plateau here, raised cattle. Um, but they, they came from uh, similar origins. Now, South Africa, Southern Africa is also unique in... Um, at least this part of Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, for the longevity and intensity of European presence. Um, and so we'll talk about that. So the Europeans began to settle in southern Africa in the middle of the 17th century and uh, settled in, in large numbers here, much larger numbers than they did in anywhere else on the continent, um, uh, both in this period and in, in the more modern times. Um, and so the European presence is the is one of the key factors in, in the history of Southern Africa, uh, at least in recent centuries. Also, lots of wars and migrations. Um, we talked last time in our discussion of East Africa about a, a group of people who were associated with the Nguni peoples. 
that can be transliterated as N-G-O-N-I as well. Don't get confused between this and the textbook. These are the same people we're talking about. Uh, there are, uh, the Nguni is a subgroup of the Bantu language group. Um, it comprises uh, several different languages. Tosa, um, Swazi, uh, Zulu, uh, Ndebele, these are all Nguni languages. And for the most part, the Nguni peoples were those who settled down here in the southeastern part of what is now South Africa, the land that was suitable for agriculture. Um, and uh, now, you know, uh, as we talked about, there were Nguni people who fleeing wars and conflicts uh, in the early 19th century made it as far north as, well, what is now Kenya and Tanzania and Malawi. Um, well, that was prompted by some of the things that we're going to be talking about in this lecture. Um, and so, you know, all through this period that we're, we're discussing, um, uh, the, the 19th century up through the first three quarters of the, of the 19th century, people were, were moving a great deal. Uh, the Nguni people, due to the, the wars uh, that we'll discuss, the Khoisan peoples uh, who, you know, were, were being pushed by both the, the white European population and the Bantu and... Uh, the white Europeans themselves often um, migrating from one part of South Africa to another uh, for reasons that we'll discuss. And so these are uh, in engaging in war uh, warfare with uh, different African populations as they moved. Um, and so these are fairly well uh, constants all through this period. So let's talk about European settlement. And this is going to take us back a little bit out of the, um, the narrative timeline of the course, but some... Um, uh, what we have to realize when we talk about the European presence in Southern Africa is that there are people with real, uh, c you know, commitments to this history. That um, uh, the the white people of European stock um, uh, who have lived in South Africa now for um, going on four centuries uh, believe that they were. This is their native land. They they are Africans, and so they constructed partly to justify the construction of um, terribly unequal societies, the segregation, uh, segregated societies of the late nineteenth and early twentieth centuries, and then finally the apartheid state uh, of the mid to late twentieth century. Um, they did this all with a. a with a historical justification, and one part one part of that historical justification is the claim, and this is historically inaccurate, but um, uh, it was believed for a long time. The claim that uh, that Europeans arrived in Southern Africa at roughly the same time as the Bantus. In fact, they may have, in their view, they may have predated Bantu settlement in this region. Thus, they encountered an empty land. We can put the words empty land into quotation marks there, I suppose. Uh, it wasn't empty, um, even in the area uh, that they initially settled in, uh, the Cape region, uh, forming what is now Cape Town and spreading out from there. Uh, there were uh, Khoisan peoples living there. Well, the San uh, don't seem to merit any kind of attention, don't seem to be seen as problematic in this narrative or even notable at all. Um, uh, the San, of course, were overrun by the whites and victimized by them. Um, but uh, uh, thus, the Europeans, the, the Afrikaners, as they come to be called, claim that South Africa was theirs originally, um, and that the Bantus were actually interlopers, uh, uh, arriving again at the same time or, or you know shortly after, and so they don't have any claim as natives. Well. Uh, recent research, and by recent I mean in the last you know several decades, um, has shown uh, pretty convincingly that Bantu migration into this area preceded uh, white settlements by many centuries, probably uh, dating back around a thousand CE, and so you know six and a half centuries is a lot of time. Uh, and then again, I mean that even that ignores the presence of the San people who had been there for hundreds of thousands of years um, uh, in some form. Uh, the first European settlement in the area um, was right on the uh, tip of the, the Cape of Storms, as it was called, or later uh, the Cape of Good Hope. Um, uh, it was a 
colony uh, headed by a Dutchman named Jan van Riebeck. Um, and this was not an extension or uh, under the auspices of the Dutch government, but it was rather under the, the auspices of what was known as the VOC. I put the flag of the VOC here, uh, and that is uh, an acronym, um, and I don't know what it is in Dutch. I don't have it on the tip of my tongue here, but um, translated as the Dutch East India Company which in the 17th century was one of the great powers in the world, um, economically speaking. Uh, powerful enough that, I mean, this is in an era really before the emergence of, of European nations, per se. Um, they functioned as um, a state, making their own treaties, uh, you know, really running their own economy. I mean, this, this was a major force. And they were sponsored by the Dutch mercantilist government uh, and supported by them, but they functioned in ways that were completely independent of the Dutch. And so when we talk about, or rather of the Dutch government, uh, that was staffed mostly by Dutch people, of course, um, when we talk about the Dutch expansion into various parts of the world, uh, into South Africa, into Indonesia, and places like that, we really are talking about the Dutch East India Company. and. There are a few notable things about these Dutch people who begin to settle in southern Africa. One is that they um, were company workers, uh, and in some cases, as you know, has been the case, uh, I think probably all throughout all of human history, uh, people get tired of their jobs and they want to do something else, and so many of these people uh, left the initial settlements of Cape Town and began to strike it out into the countryside and, and to set up their own farms. As they did so, they came into contact with the Khoisan peoples, uh, often um, simultaneously enslaving them and intermingling with them in various ways, um, uh, including sexually, uh, and producing, as a result, um, a group of mixed-race people uh, who were often victimized even by those who were their biological fathers. Um, uh, this was a, a land that was populated um, in the 17th century almost entirely by men, uh, the, the employees of the Dutch East India Company. And so seeking female companionship meant for most of them to go and find an African uh, whom they could either convince uh, to um, sleep with them or, or probably more often the case, rape them. Um, and uh, thus, from the 17th century, when racial attitudes were really quite relaxed uh, among company men, that wasn't something the Dutch East India Company really cared to monitor so much, um, and ideas about, I mean, racial stereotypes and, and uh, concerns about racial mixing and things like that really weren't in place, even in Europe uh, at this point, um, as they were later. Um, and so they, I mean, the population of this mixed race population grew to be fairly significant over time. Uh, at the same time as um, uh, these people began to develop strong racial notions, by the mid 18th century, 100 years or so on, um, there were already laws put into place forbidding miscegenation. Um, now that, uh, you know, there were entire families. Um, who were moving from Europe uh, to settle in South Africa. Um, so uh, that was a convoluted uh, kind of discussion there. And uh, really, I mean, there are a couple of points uh, that, that you want to take away from this is that the, these Dutch settlers, who were joined later by um, Protestants fleeing the religious conflicts of the 17th century, especially French Huguenots uh, fleeing the the uh, persecution under King Louis XIV. Um, some of them went to Florida, actually, but a large number of them ended up in South Africa. Also some German immigrants. These joined with these original Dutch settlers to form a community. Um, and uh, as they did this, they... Um, now, the other... Um, I'll come back to that point in a second. The other... Uh, aspect of these Dutch settlers and also the French Huguenots was that they were Calvinist in religion and uh, Calvinism, and this isn't the place to go into detail about Calvinism or about the Protestant Reformation, but um, Calvinism had at its heart the doctrine of um, predestination which supposed that certain people were simply by the will of God saved 
destined to be saved, and everybody else was destined to be damned. And uh, these Calvinists um, uh, saw that as the great reality in the world. Um, and uh, in their eyes, very few people would be saved, and there was really no point, or very little point, in trying to go out and convert people, or worry about their souls, or really worry about ethical treatments of other people's. Because if they weren't Christian, it was, you know, that, that was a pretty good sign that they were not going to be saved by God. Um, the, the Calvinist God is, uh, and I'm really kind of generalizing, uh, perhaps over much here, um, but the Calvinist God is an angry God. Um, you know, if you consider uh, one of the more famous Calvinist sermons from uh, the Puritan community, um, in uh, not well, yeah the the Puritan community which had a very sort of Calvinist bent to it uh, in um, Massachusetts uh, Jonathan Edwards sermon sinners in the hands of an angry God uh, even the title itself gives an indication of of Calvinist ideas and so the reason I bring this up is that um, this Calvinist background informed the way that the whites treated Africans whether we're talking about uh, Khoisan people or, or Bantu people, um, uh, in their minds these people were damned. Uh, they, they were not destined to be, um, to be saved, um, so there's really no point in trying to Christianize them, at least for the most part, um, and they can be treated uh, as slaves. And this was in an era when slavery was of course acceptable. Uh, and so there was a good deal of slavery in the, in the Cape. Uh, now, um, I talked about these people who you know got fed up with working for the VOC and decided to head out into the countryside and um, and become farmers. As they did so, they you know they, they took over land that had been occupied um, by the uh, initially by the Khoisan people, um, uh, or at least the the uh, pastoralists among them. The response of the Khoisan was largely to move far out of the reach of. Um, these uh, Europeans, uh, and as they moved further and further to the east, they started to come into contact with the Bantus. Now, these people are known um, historically uh, as the Boers, that is a Dutch word and also an Afrikaans word for farmer. Um, the word I have up here, trekboer, um, is, uh, just means like pioneering farmer or um, homesteader, right? Somebody who leaves the safety of the colony and goes out and homesteads independently. And there were, were over time, a, a fairly large number of these. Uh, they scoffed at the, the laws that the you know colony based in Cape Town tried to put into place. They really had this very strong independence streak. And uh, among the facets of their, um, their society were, of course, the institution of slavery. They felt that it was their right, their privilege, um, and indeed, in some cases, sanctioned by God for them to enslave these African uh, people who were barely, uh, barely qualified in, in their minds as human beings. Um, now, the the term Greek war refers to this mixed race people. Um, these people of mixed race origins, uh, the result of this early miscegenation uh, in the Cape uh, settlement, uh, ended up forming their own communities. They had a, a sort of cohesive um, uh, cohesive ethos, um, uh, and uh, leave, many of them left uh, Cape Town and, and left the vicinity, um, the land occupied by the by the white Europeans and form their own communities, um, taking up farming and, and especially cattle raising. Uh, they also took with them, though, um, the Dutch language um, and, to some extent, uh, the Christianity um, of the Dutch, the Calvinist Christianity. And so the Greek were, over time, have maintained, I think, a closer cultural tie, probably. Uh, to the Europeans than they have to other, and this may sound this may sound very strange um, for Americans to hear, where you know th there's no necessarily concern about racially about being you know of pure African origin or something like that or being of mixed race descent. I mean, people 
these days at least sort of choose uh, whatever racial category they want to fit into or, or you know, no racial category at all. Um, apologies if you're hearing a baby crying. I am again, recording this at home and I have children in the house, so um, hopefully that's not too distracting. Um, but uh, the Greek uh, really identified with each other and formed a category uh, unto themselves culturally largely European, Christian, Dutch language, um, but uh, still a, a separate racial category. And so um, you, you might think that there's a, a big alliance between the Griqua and the, and the people of Bantu origin, the blacks as they're simply known in, in South Africa. There has not been historically, um, though the Griqua have also been, or, or uh, the other term that's used often for the Griqua is coloreds. Um, uh, people who are colored are people of mixed race origins, um, but they have pursued their own um, their own agendas largely. Now, uh, as a result of the wars that came about with French independence, uh, France and England fought a series of wars starting in the early 1790s. Um, one of the results of that was that the British, um, in seeking to establish dominance over the sea lanes seized control of Cape Colony, or rather seized control of the Cape, which had been uh, for a while under the auspices of the Dutch government after it passed out of the hands of the VOC uh, in the 18th century. Uh, they took control of it and set up a colony and sponsored um, several thousand British people to recruited, I should say, them to go and settle in, in the Cape. Um, so they established a colony there. And this produced a great deal of tension with the uh, people who were or had already been there for a century and a half, um, who we can call at this point either the Boers or the Afrikaners probably is a better term for this. Um, though whether they were using that term at this point is, is questionable. I'm not sure that, that they were, but this, this group eventually becomes known as the Afrikaners. And so we'll use that as a, to try to be consistent here. Afrikaners often viewed these British people as effete urbanites who did not understand at all the uh, realities of life in this harsh frontier zone. Particularly, they were disgusted by the fairly liberal ideas that many British people had about the treatment of black Africans. Um, uh, again, these, you know, people of Dutch origin, uh, the Afrikaners, had felt no qualms, uh, or at least they justified very well, the practice of enslaving Africans, um, both the, the Khoisan peoples and the, and the Bantus. Um, and the British came in and tried to establish laws uh, that uh, required employers to give even black African laborers a contract um, and certain other privileges. Uh, they tried to do away with slavery, given that this was the era in which um, the British were uh, were trying to stop the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, the practice of slavery among Europeans in, in Africa was seen as abhorrent by many British, and the Afrikaners were simply disgusted by this. And so they, many of them at least, um, moved further and further away from Cape Town uh, into the into the countryside um, where they could set up their own farms and be far away from any kind of British interference. And these tensions would not let up anytime soon, really until the middle of the 20th century or so, um, when both the British and the, and the Afrikaners became invested of, uh, of necessity, really, at least in their minds, uh, uh, in apartheid, um, I mean, those tensions existed for a very, very long time, and they date to the earliest years of British involvement in in the Cape. Um, so we have a situation where the British control Cape Town and are trying to establish these laws, and the Afrikaners are doing their best to ignore it and continue to enslave the African population and, and try to act in ways that are independent there. And we see this tension manifest in a series of wars um, with the closest Bantu group to these areas of European settlement. Uh, these are the Kosa people. Um, the X there is the transliteration of one of the cliques in this language. Um, so that's why it's spelled that way. 
But the Xhosa people lived, let's see, I have a map here. Now you can see that, uh, so here's Cape Town and really kind of the area of settlements where these trek boars moved out, you know, out of, out of the Cape, or out of, out of Cape Town, uh, further into the countryside, uh, all across the coastline here. Um, the coastline does have a, have fairly, um, have land that is suitable for, agri for agriculture. Um, uh, and they eventually ran into the Xhosa people who lived over here in, in land that was also very good for farmland. And so we see some skirmishes between the Trek Boers and, and the Xhosa. Um, uh, the British tried to tamp this down. I mean, none of these wars were very definitive. These are taking place in the, uh, the first two or three decades of the uh, 19th century. Um, and uh, even though the the Afrikaners had superior technology. Um, they couldn't always hold on to the, the lands that they had gained, and the Xhosa would form raiding parties and, and raid white settlements and, and even in some cases massacre the, the inhabitants there. And so, I mean, this is just the first couple of stages of a, a many-stage series of wars between um, Europeans and the, and the Xhosa uh, that were not concluded really until about the 1860s. Now, let's leave that to the side for a second here uh, and focus on the region to the, to the east of uh, the Cape here. So, you know, this region now, what is now called KwaZulu-Natal, uh, up here. Um, this was a, a land populated by the Nguni people. It was good for agriculture, um, a very fertile land. Uh, but in the late 18th century, um, probably due to, to simple, you know, fluctuations of climate change, um, what had been adequate rainfall dried up to some extent, and there was a, a fairly significant drought. And so these Nguni peoples had lived in isolated homesteads and small villages. Um, there was no cohesion among them on any large scale. But with the drought, uh, these people began to form larger communities. Um, uh, and chieftains... Uh, organized the, or, or placed themselves at the at the head of these Nguni um, uh, these Nguni groups. Now, um, as of the the late uh, 18th century, there were three major groups, um, and I'm not going to give you their names. So you can find them in the textbook, uh, but uh, th these formed fairly large significant polities in different parts of um, uh, of that region east of the Drakensberg Mountains there um, and uh, fought with each other and, and began in the process to transform their societies. Um, and uh, that transformation would continue into the next era when um, uh, a series of very dramatic events completely altered the political and cultural and social balance of this whole region. Now, the person who stands at the head of this sequence of events, um, which is known uh, in, I mean, sort of collectively as the Umfekane, and you can see that term at the at the top of the slide there. This is a Xhosa term. Um, that uh, has connotations of hunger and, and depredation. Um, there's also a, um, uh, uh, a Sutu word, Sutu, another language uh, from this region, not Nguni, actually, a um, uh, different, different subset of Bantu. But uh, Difakane means, even though it sounds very similar, means um, uh, scattering. Okay. So the Umfakane, or this, this period of crisis, this period of scattering, uh, begins with Shaka Zulu. Now, the <laughs> I, I often, when I talk about Shaka in various classes, I, I put up this image of him. This was the, the standard image of Shaka Zulu that was circulated by Europeans. And I do it really um, kind of tongue-in-cheek here. Uh, Shaka Zulu probably looked nothing like that. I don't mean in his physical features. Um, there are descriptions of him, um, but uh, the physical features are less important here than both what he's carrying and how he's dressed. Um, uh, 
the European artist depicting Shaka here seems to be conflating him with a Native American with this massive feather. I don't know how that would be practical or even decorative, um, but uh, it seemed to fit with the kind of savage king image that Shaka tended to have. He was a figure of some fascination among Europeans in this period and in, in later eras, actually. Um, and has remained uh, a source of mystery and intrigue uh, all the way to the present, at least among certain audiences. The other thing that's totally inaccurate about this is, well, I mean, the, the um, costume is not Zulu. Uh, again, this looks vaguely Native American. Um, really doesn't fit with the way the Zulu actually dress. Um, but um, the, the other thing that's really horribly wrong about this is the, the spear and the shield. Um, Shaka's greatest innovations were military. And some of this was already being put into place in this earlier era with the establishment of these large Nguni chieftain, uh, uh, chieftaincies or uh, the large uh, uh, political, uh, large polities. Maybe that's the best word for it. Um, but uh, Shaka continued with these innovations and introduced a number of new uh, inventions into warfare that were tremendously effective. And so warfare, as it had existed in southern Africa, and it seems in other parts of Africa, um, but especially in southern Africa, had consisted of um, rather disorganized groups of men um, meeting up with the uh, another disorganized group of men on the other side of the battlefield, holding, sorry for the yawn, um, holding large shields and long spears. And they would throw these spears at their enemies um, really as a show of masculinity. They might occasionally hit their targets and, and even kill somebody, but um, these battles were for the most part light in casualties and were really just shows of strength uh, until, you know, I mean, they, they ended when one side would flee the battlefields because they were getting hit by spears or they recognized that they were they had inferior numbers or, or whatever it was. Um, but uh, And so warfare was, I don't want to say it's entirely symbolic, but it was not this tremendously organized thing with, you know, large uh, uh, regimented armies um, and uh, lots and lots of casualties on the battlefield. Well, Shaka altered all of that. Rather than carry the big shields and long spears that had characterized warfare, he introduced a small shield that could be easily held with one and manipulated with one hand, and a short spear, which would uh, which was used not for throwing but rather for stabbing. Um, he also introduced, um, tactically speaking, <coughs> these engulfing maneuvers. Sorry, I need to take a drink there. Um, but uh, and so these were called the bull's horns. Uh, he would send his troops uh, on both sides of both flanks of the enemy, and they would gradually, in, or, or in fairly quick fashion, engulf them, and then use these short stabbing spears to decimate their opponents. Um, the few survivors would flee the battlefield. Um, Shaka had a reputation for cruelty. Uh, he seems to have delighted in in bloodshed we might say um, but that may just be the characterization of him uh, but he did win a number of victories in tremendously impressive impressive fashion um, and this sent a message to lots of other people uh, that he was not to be trifled with now Shaka had come from a fairly small group known as the Zulu uh, who were a subset of one of these larger polities um, but uh, over time, he came to, I mean, they, they won so many battles and they caused so much dislocation that the, the Zulu were able to, under Shaka, were able to establish a, a fairly large kingdom and incorporate lots of peoples into it. Now, the other innovation that was already underway before Shaka, but which, of which he took great advantage, was an age regiment system. And this is... This actually is not something that I think is too hard to wrap our minds around because we have, in many ways, an age-regimented system uh, in the West. 
where you know people until they reach a certain age are considered small children and they don't even have they don't have to go to school they remain at home under the care of their parents and that's just the way things are done once they reach the age of 5 or 6 then they head off to school and so they enter a new age regiment which is we might say elementary school and then junior high and then high school or we might just lump all of that together into uh, primary and secondary education um, but their primary responsibility in society is to go to school and receive an education and then we have an age regiment I think of college students where you know between the ages of say 18 and 23 or something like that uh, a large percentage um, maybe the majority of uh, uh, of people in, in the, that age range are um, uh, their primary task is to, well, do, do some work, but uh, to receive further education. Um, and then there's an age regiment of uh, people who are in the midst of their careers uh, that extends all the way to um, uh, until people are in their 60s, early 70s, probably. And, um, and then they enter a different age regiment, which is retired. Well, the, the Zulu had a system like this as well. Uh, and this was not uncommon in Africa. Um, there were even initiation rituals that you know marked the passage from one age group to another. Um, for men, especially, this involved circumcision um, in most of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but uh, these age regiment uh, systems were linked in with the military, and so people of a certain age group were placed into military ranks. Um, these are mostly young men. And their chief role in society came to be, uh, to be that of warriors. They were highly trained, highly disciplined soldiers, trained by Shaka and his uh, lieutenants in the use of these weapons and the tactics of the battlefield. Um, and they, you know, and that was their primary purpose. Once they reached a certain age, then they you know, they moved on and, and became uh, the farmers and uh, uh, the, the cattle raisers of the society. But uh, for a time, all of the, the, the young men in, these, in the Zulu society were warriors. Well, this made them easily more um, effective because they spent a lot of time in training and uh, in warfare, um, easily more effective than, than any other military force that anyone could muster in southern Africa and this is one of the reasons for their success. The other thing that, that Shaka did uh, that really is quite um, brilliant, I mean he had a, a personal charisma that seems to have been a part of the one of the secrets to his success but he also brought about a series of rituals that um, reinforced his leadership of the society and also reinforced uh, the age regiments and other uh, other features of the society. This was not limited to Zulu people because that was a very small group um, under uh, the, within the, the larger group known as the Mtetwa. That's one of the three chieftaincies that I talked about earlier. Um, uh, the Zulu came to incorporate uh, lots of different peoples into their ranks and they placed them in the age regiments, they involved them in the rituals, and these people converted, as it were, they became Zulu over time. And so what had been a very small and uh, non-cohesive group ended up being a very large and cohesive and powerful group. And so this, this uh, um, strategy of inclusion was tremendously important. And, you know, given that they were immediately placed in these age regiments and uh, they were given tasks in the society and, and put to work. Uh, they found a place very easily. Shaka did waffle between inclusion and massacre. Um, uh, he seems to have had it out for certain peoples and respected other peoples. Um, but over the course of his you know, decade or, or a little more long military career, he created a, a, a massive polity, a tremendously powerful kingdom, um, with this advanced military as its uh, uh, as its main feature, um, so this is the expansion. Now, true to the nature of the society that he had created, Shaka was assassinated, um, almost certainly with the collusion, and maybe at the hand of his brother Dingane, who who took his place as king. Um, 
but uh, Dingane and later Mpanda, who succeeded him, uh, put into place the or, or kept in place the structures that Shaka had pioneered. Uh, neither Ningani or nor Mpande uh, were um, as effective as Shaka had been. Uh, Dingani, in particular, suffered some defeats that uh, that lessened his stature in the eyes of uh, his people and, and led to his death as well. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, Shaka is a, a really kind of towering figure um, in 19th century African history for, for all of these reasons. Um, okay, now, what were the effects of the Zulu expansion? Well, you can see here this schematic, okay, um, that the, you know, the Zulu originated in this area, um, and uh, they sort of pushed everybody else out. Okay, this this map doesn't have to do with the, the Mfakana. I'm just trying to give you a, a sense with this um, of the relationship between different peoples. And so, you know, we have these various Nguni peoples. You have the Kosa down here, uh, the Zulu here, here the, the Drakensberg Mountains. You have the Sutu people up here in the in the mountains. Here, the Griqua, um, and uh, and so there were various Nguni peoples. Well, as the Zulu began to expand, they pushed. A number of Nguni groups who were not Zulu, who were rivaling the Zulu, um, into other areas. Some of them crossed the Drakensberg, uh, the Ndebele, for instance, uh, fled across the Drakensberg after being defeated by the Zulu. The Swazi fled up here into a, a mountainous region that became known eventually as Swaziland. Um, uh, so the Ndebele, under the leadership of, of uh, Mzili Kazi, uh, their chief. They occupied the high felt, the plateau up there. And then other Nguni peoples, you know, left, some of them ranging far and wide over southern and eastern Africa. We talked about these people already last time. Uh, destabilizing those regions, forming these bands of Ruga Ruga, uh, these pot smoking uh, young men who were, you know, ready to become mercenaries and uh, engage in slave trading or, or whatever. Uh, they could do to, to make a living, uh, to procure wealth. Um, and so, you know, this, this had effects far outside of, uh, of South Africa. Uh, so we talked about Swaziland. Um, another important figure um, in this period, and this guy was around for a very long time. Uh, he's already, um, I, I don't know his exact dates of rule, um, but he dates to the time of Shaka. Uh, and is still around uh, as late as the 1860s. Um, this is King. Now, uh, the, uh, the pronunciation here um, is it's a good thing it's an online class because we're not, uh, none of you have to actually pronounce any of these names. Um, but this is pronounced in Sutu as Mushweshwe. The O E is a, is a way sound, uh, Mushweshwe. Um, King Mushweshwe, uh, who took leadership of the Sutu people, these are not an Nguni group, different language group, but. Um, uh, <clears throat> under his leadership, the Sutu established uh, a kind of stronghold up here in the mountains and specifically in the Caledon River Valley. Um, and uh, this is going to be the origins of Lesotho, though there are a few things that um, need to happen still before that. Uh, and so, and uh, other Sutu groups, uh, the Northern Sutu or the Petty group, uh, you know, fled up here into. Uh, uh, into the high field. Uh, the Tswana people were pushed by the Ndebele uh, further to the west and even up here into the Kalahari somewhat. Um, and so this is a massive chain reaction of various peoples fleeing to different parts of southern and, and eastern Africa. Um, another Nguni group, the Mfengu, uh, defeated by the Zulu, fled to the Kosa and joined together with the Kosa. That gives us a sense of the fluidity uh, of these ethnic identities. Um, uh, in this period. And so, I mean, these are just a few of the groups involved in this, this massive sequence of events. Now, as all of that's going on, um, the Afrikaners were becoming more and more fed up with the British, with the interference the British were trying to make into their lives. The British were trying to prevent the Afrikaners, for instance, from uh, continuing to try to occupy Kosa uh, land in the Eastern Cape. Um, they were, you know, trying to force them to stop uh, the system of slavery. They were trying to make them produce contracts for their African workers. I mean, all of this was just seen as abhorrent by these Afrikaners. And so over the course of about 15 to 20 years, 
thousands of these trek boars, these Afrikaners, uh, left the Cape region and made, in some cases, monumental pioneering journeys all the way up here into the High Felt and some of them even down here into KwaZulu Natal. This is known as the Great Trek. It uh, coincides in time with the the era of pioneering in the United States. If you think of covered wagons and uh, uh, things like that, I mean, this is the very same period of time as the Oregon Trail and the California Trail and the Mormon Trail and all of these things are in operation. Um, uh, probably using very similar types of transportation and technology. Um, now, as they did this, uh, so, so th these were formed, um, or this, this migration happened um, in uh, largely in kinship groups. Families would join together under the leadership of some kind of patriarch, uh, forming these trek parties, and they would strike it out. Again, very similar probably to the sort of migration we see in the mid-19th century via covered wagon and handcart and other things across the, uh, across the plains into the western United States. Um, uh, now, many of them settled in, in the Fall River region. Uh, the Fall River is oh, right here. If you look at the mouse there, the cursor. Um, uh, and so the region to the north of the Fall comes to be known as the Trans Fall, uh, the, the region across the Fall River. Some of them settled you know, down here, uh, actually close to where the Sutu were. Um, as they did so, they came into conflict with the African peoples, the Bantu peoples who had settled in this region, many of them fairly recently fleeing the predations of the Zulu during the Umfakane. Um, they, uh, in some cases even, the, um, uh, the, the trek, the, the four trekkers, as they're called, uh, ended up allying with certain African groups to oppose other African groups. This is how they defeated the Undebele, uh, who had just settled in the, in the high field there. They forced them across the Limpopo River up here into what is now southern Zimbabwe, and they remain there all the way to the present. Um, uh, so they go to what is known as Matabele land or southern Zimbabwe. Some of these four trekker groups ended up going to Natal and coming into conflict with the Zulu. Um, and uh, most famously, um, during the Battle of what's no, came, came to be known as the Battle of Blood River, um, and the blood there refers to the blood of the Zulu. Uh, that even though the Zulus had them outnumbered, uh, the these trek these four trekkers had advanced technology. They had modern guns, um, rifles. They also had cannons. Uh, essentially, they had firearms. And at this point, the Zulu really didn't. They were using still their stabbing spears and their engulfing maneuvers. And um, as as some accounts of this put it. Uh, this battle, you know, lasted all night. The Zulu sent wave after wave of uh, warriors to try to oust the four trekkers from their position, and they failed in every case um, due to the uh, the guns, the firearms that the that the whites had, um, and uh, thus the and this was disastrous for Dingane. This led to a civil war among the Zulu that um, uh, in, in which Dingane lost his life. Um, and so, you know, the inability to prevent the whites from settling in, in KwaZulu was, was terrible for Ningane. Um, the, with the whites now um, having defeated the Zulu, I mean, not resoundingly, they haven't taken over all of their territory, obviously, but they've in some ways made it, uh, they, they've exposed the weakness of the Zulu. Many of these Nguni peoples came back to Natal, um, further complicating things here. Um, and they, of course, began to enslave uh, these, these Africans. Seeing what the Afrikaners were doing in Natal, particularly among the Zulu, and partly due to um, diplomatic arrangements made, uh, or the, the appeals from the various Bantu peoples to the British uh, to try to stop, you know, uh, 
internal slavery and things like that, uh, the British decided to annex Natal. In fact, it became known as Natal at this point. Um, and so they formed a second colony in South Africa. And this led most of these Afrikaners to vacate the area to go back across the Drakensberg Mountains. Not all of them. There were a few who stayed uh, deciding to try to tolerate living under British rule again, but most of them left um, and ended up forming their own republics. Um, and so they established eventually two republics, um, the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. Um, well, I'll talk about native reserves in a moment here. You can look at this, and this, this map is a bit further on in time, but you can see the map of, of South Africa here. Here you have the Cape Colony extending all the way over here, and here you have Natal, which is uh, another British colony, of course. Uh, up here you have, and you can see it on the map very clearly, Zululand. So this area is still occupied by the Zulu. Here is Swaziland. Okay. But then here you have the Orange Free State and the South African Republic, otherwise known as the Transvaal. And so these were both independent of British rule, uh, you know, under the, the governorship of Afrikaners. Um, the other one that uh, I didn't mention here was that uh, in the 1860s, as, as all of this was coming to a head, um, many of these Afrikaners had moved into the Caledon River Valley and forced the Sutu people under the leadership of Moshwe further up into the mountains. Moshwe made a treaty, I was really quite astute in doing this, made a treaty with the British um, uh, such that this region here, which is really in the, in the heart of the mountains, became known as Basutu land. Uh, and uh, this was really a British effort to to stop the Afrikaners from going into this area and continuing to occupy this territory um, to protect the Sutu via treaty again. Uh, this was a British protectorate, and I'll talk uh, in a later class about what a protectorate is. That's something that we need to discuss uh, more fully when we talk about colonialism. Um, they also established a protectorate over this region up here, which um, where the Tswana speaking people were known as Bechuana land, uh, the British protectorate of Bechuana land. The other thing that the British did though, uh, and this is um, this brings us back to the Xhosa people in the south. Um, and this map is, is from much further on in time, but I'm talking about the origins of these kinds of things here. So the Xhosa people, as we saw, uh, were in this region down here. and. The Afrikaners had tried to push back and occupy this territory, and eventually most of them left and, and went north uh, up here with the four trekkers. But more and more British, as more and more British people came to uh, the Cape, uh, wanted to settle there, they saw that by far the best farmland was over here in the Eastern Cape, in, in land occupied by the Tosa. And so the British gradually, and with the help of their military, um, annexed more and more of this land, uh, which was Tosa land, for the Cape Colony. And they, you know, protected British settlers who began to, to occupy those lands. In some cases, the Tosa tried to strike back, and then this led to a series of wars, the details of which are too complex to go into uh, in this class, necessarily. There is one kind of high point, and this really is the end of the Tosa as a as a resistance force. In the, in the middle of the 1850s, um, as the Tosa were led by um, a chief named Haleka, uh, there was uh, a young woman, uh, a young woman named Non Kawuse. These, these names all have clicks in them. Um, and uh, Non Kawuse was a prophetess. She had a reputation for being able to access the spirits of the ancestors. And uh, she delivered a prophecy stating that if the Tosa would kill all of their cattle, this makes absolutely no sense, but uh, in some cases religious beliefs don't, right? Um, so as a matter of faith. Uh, if, the, if the Tosa would kill all of their cattle. Now these are people who were cattle raisers, and cattle was a very important part of their society, and not a measure of their wealth, but if they would kill all of their cattle, that the spirits of the ancestors would cleanse the land and would give them much larger cattle herds than they had had previously, and moreover would uh, expel the British from their territory. 
Um, now, the British, uh, during this period, many of the Xhosa cattle had also suffered from a, a, a pandemic uh, disease known as rinderpest, and so they were already, uh, their, their herds had already been decimated. Well, the Xhosa ended up killing hundreds of thousands of head of cattle, uh, listening to Nonkawuse. And, of course, the spirits of the ancestors, it seems, did not end up cleansing the land or forcing the British out. What this led them to, basically, was starvation and complete destitution. And, ultimately, the Xhosa capitulated to the, um, uh, to the British and were forced. Uh, their lands were halved. They were forced across uh, the Kai River um, here into this region, which the British set up as a reserve. Um, it was known, in fact, as the Trans-Kai, uh, the, the, uh, for the Kai River there. Um, and there was also a, a small reserve here called the Siskai, um, or the, the reserve on this side of the Kai River. Um, and uh, this was to be uh, Hosa territory. It was to be occupied by them. But, of course, the best farmland was in the area that was annexed by the British and now came into British settlement. Um, and uh, more and more of these Tosa were forced onto these lands. And many of them also took up work on the farms of either the Afrikaners up here in the Orange Free State or the British down here in the Cape. Uh, and more and more of these African people um, became subject to Europeans uh, became dependent on Europeans, most of them functioning as sharecroppers or little more than serfs uh, in some cases, especially among the Afrikaners. Um, let's see what else is okay. That's for the next, uh, next presentation. So that's the end of this lecture. Uh, if you have questions, please ask them on the discussion boards. I look forward to talking about these issues with you um, uh, on the discussion boards. Thank you.